Good morning. Morning. If you have your Bibles, open up to Hebrews chapter 6. Today is the wrap-up. Uh, Laura Jones, she and Travis follow our messages via YouTube. And she had a friend that sent her uh, this article that I'm going to read to you. We don't know for sure who wrote this. Uh, it's kind of a statement, I guess. Uh, some people say that it was a, a pastor uh, over in Niger who was uh, being persecuted for his faith, uh, was told that he could either renounce Christ or he would be executed. And, and he wrote this as his final statement. Other people say, no, it was actually over in Asia somewhere. I, I don't know who wrote it. I don't know the circumstances under which they wrote it. But I think it is a powerful testimony to someone whose life has been changed by Christ. So I'm going to read this. It's titled, I am a disciple. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of His. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, plaudits, or a popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on His presence, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven. My road is narrow, my way rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, turned away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, ponder at the poor of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till He comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till He stops me. And when He comes for His own, He will have no problem recognizing me, for my banner will be lifted clear. That is written by somebody who is very obviously completely sold out. Yes. So we are going to wrap, wrap up the elementary doctrines of our faith. I just want to kind of bring everything around and, and put it in one place. Uh, I do have copies of this. I'm not going to read all of the scripture passages. Um, we don't have sufficient time today. That's what the last six, seven weeks has been for us to get into each one of these in detail. So I'm just going to kind of recap what we've been looking at as part of discipleship. We should understand what these elementary doctrines, what these foundational understandings are. So we're going to read, uh, we're going to back up into chapter 5 because the writer of Hebrews did not break his writing out in chapters. And to understand where we start in 6, we have to understand where he came from in 5. So we're going to back up to verse 11 of chapter 5. He is speaking about Jesus being the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Now, to us, this doesn't mean a whole lot because we weren't brought up Jewish. We weren't brought up under the culture of the priesthood because God, when He called out Israel to be His own and He freed them from captivity in Egypt, he appointed the tribe of Levi to be his own. And of the tribe of Levi, 
he, he appointed the line of Aaron to be his priests. And Aaron was the first high priest. And so the writer of Hebrews is addressing an issue that the Hebrews understand kind of knit into their way of thinking. But he's saying something that almost comes across as completely contradictory because he's saying our, our high priest, Jesus Christ, is not of the order of Levi. He's of the order of Melchizedek, who had no beginning and no end. And yet our forefather Abraham bowed before him and gave him offerings. But then he goes on and he says, About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you become dull of hearing. Notice the problem is not with the explaining, but with the hearing. I want to caution us as a, as a church, as members of the body of Christ. We have to have acute hearing. We can't allow our hearing to become dull or hard. Because when God speaks us to something and He speaks it to our spirit, oftentimes our culture, our life, the things going on around us are telling us the exact opposite. Okay? So don't be dull of hearing. He says this is the condition that they're in. You've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk not solid food. Do you pray that you are able to take solid food? That, that you could move beyond the milk of the Word and get into the real meat of the Word? That, that you would be able to be in such a place that God could entrust you with the deeper things of God? Or are you content to live a, a surface life? Where, where you just kind of take the milk and, and you're good, you're content. That's not a good place to be. We see here, this is not a good place to be. Verse 13, For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of dis discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. That should have been the voice of God. <laughs> I'm going to read that again. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So a couple things I want to point out real quick. We are all expected to have powers of discernment. And we refine those powers of discernment. We make them sharp <coughs> by constant practice. We're always checking. Is this good or is this evil? And I tell you right now, this is something that we don't like to do because oftentimes the Word of God speaks contrary to our deeply held beliefs. Okay? We, we really don't want to hear those things that contradict what we want to be so. But if we are constantly practicing, holding everything up in the light of God's Word, submitting it under His authority, and seeing what He would have of it, that constant practice makes us sharp discerners. So into chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore... Let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Now, these next things are what he is calling the elementary doctrine. Alright, and there's, there's six different things that we've looked at. He says, we will go on to maturity not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. There's one. And of faith toward God. There's two. And of instruction about washings, there's three. The laying on of hands, four. The resurrection of the dead, five. And eternal judgment, six. And then he, he kind of caps it right here in verse three. He says, and this we will do if God permits. I don't think he's saying, well, you know, if God chooses to let us do this, we're going to advance. 
I think that's kind of uh, a rhetorical statement. Obviously, God wants us to do this because He wants us to be mature. He doesn't want us to remain infants. He wants us to grow in faith. He wants us to get to the point where when somebody comes and asks us a particular thing about what we believe, we have a, a, an answer to give them. And the only way we're going to know that answer is to get in the Word. To, to, to be intimate, to be familiar with this. So let's go back. We're going to start with repentance from dead works. Two words in the Greek that were used. The first one, matineo, means to change your mind and feel remorse. Okay? To, to change your, your thinking, and, and along with that comes a feeling of remorse. Okay? Then there's a second word, matolomeo, and that means to have the frame of mind needed for forgiveness. To be convinced. Okay? Now both of these words are talking about a, a mental process that's going on. And, and even further, because oftentimes these words are lined up with the word convert. Okay? And, and in Greek, the word for convert uh, is strepo. And it means to feel remorse such that it changes your thinking and also changes your actions. Okay, see these two things are, are co-joined. It's not enough just to have your thinking changed. That change in your thinking has got to result in a change of action. Okay? Now, repentance is when God speaks to you, whether it be through somebody's testimony or intervention in your life, through a revelation of your word or God's Spirit just revealing things to you. God is not limited. You become convinced that what He says is right. Okay? Now, we, we talk about confession, right? Do you guys understand what confession actually means? Confession is simply this. It's an agreement. And when we're speaking about confession in the church, we are agreeing with God. Okay? We are a church of profession. We like to profess our salvation. We don't like confession that much. Because we don't want people to know that we're just like them and we messed up. Because we don't really think we're just like them because they never mess up because we don't talk about it. Right? I mean, I don't want to let you guys know all my dirty secrets because, I mean, I see you guys in church every Sunday. You're perfect. I'm the only unperfect person in here. And, 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 but don't we all kind of have that idea? Isn't that kind of the mentality? Nobody really talks about their problems, so I'm not going to talk about my problems. I don't want to be the ugly duckling. I don't want to be the standout. Okay? So, confession means you agree with God, which should lead to repentance, the changing of your mind, which would lead to conversion, which is the changing of your actions. Now, I want to tell you right now that you can carry this off in some manner in your own strength. But that will be futile. Because doing it in your own strength is a work. And which of us can ever work sufficiently, perfectly enough that we would impress God? See, that, that's the whole reason that when Christ went away, He sent the Spirit of God to come into us. To seal us, to seal our salvation, and to convict us of sin, and to teach us and train us in righteousness. Okay? So we have this confession, we have repentance, and then we have conversion. And, and at that moment where you surrender your life, God stamps you, boom, with His Holy Spirit. And then His Holy Spirit starts enabling you to do those things He's called you to do. This should be a direct result of salvation. Not a works unto salvation. Okay? So if you truly are a believer in Jesus Christ, you will do what he says. I remember people came to him one time and they called him good master. And he says, why do you call me master and you don't do what I say? I'm not your master. So often we want to call him master, but we refuse to accept his lordship, his authority. Okay? So repentance. Repentance. 
to have your mind changed, to have your thinking changed. Going with conversion that would result in a change of action. Okay, from dead works. What are dead works? Anybody? Sins. Okay. What is sin? Okay. Anything that goes against what God wants. Let's let's look at it this way. Okay. We know most of you know in here that sin is an archery term. In Greek, it's an actual archery term. It would be what we call hitting the bullseye. Okay? And you line up, you get your sight set on the target, and you let fly. The distance that you missed the bullseye is sin. Okay? And the point is not whether my sin is greater or less than yours. It's the fact that it exists. That there is a distance between what God has and what He has for me and what He has called me to and where I hit. That gap is sin. Alright? Now, good news, bad news. Both the good news and the bad news is we all sin. Even after salvation, we still sin. Part of that is because our brains still run in old patterns. Okay, patterns of behavior that we've developed over a lifetime till we come to salvation. It, it's also a, a, what, what those comfortable patterns. This is how I always respond. Nobody has to guess how I'm going to respond in, in, in my house. I, I, I have an aversion to mouth noises. Okay? They, oh. <laughs> Nothing will ruin a meal faster for me than somebody making massive amounts of noise. <laughs> Anybody ever see What About Bob? And he's eating that corn. I want to reach through the screen and strangle him. We've got to fast forward this. Okay? Mouth noises. I have patterns of behavior because when people, at, when my children are at the table and there's somebody there that is making a mouth noise, guess what my kids do? They look at me, they look at that person, stop! Stop! My family, we have one rule. Okay, there's only one rule in, in our family. That's don't make dad mad. <laughs> now, there's a lot of things that can cause you to violate that rule. Chief among them is upsetting your mother. Okay, but not too far down below that is mouth noise. Okay, so, that, that just, oh, oh, okay. So, repentance from dead works, we're, we're, we are having any work that is not dedicated unto God. Now you say, okay, wait a minute, but we, we're not all called to work in the church. Exactly. You betcha. Go back to the Great Commission. What does the Great Commission say? Jesus says, uh, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, therefore because all authority is mine... I have the right to tell you what's coming next. Go. Okay? Now, now the Greek word isn't a word that, that means you're sitting and then you get up and you go. The word is as you are going. As you are doing life. As you just happen to be living. You're to preach the gospel. Say, well... You know, I, I, I work in a secular business and, and I, you know what, the way you live your life, the way you phrase your words, the language you use tells a whole lot more about you to people than anything you ever say directly to them ever will amount to. Because I can say, hey man, I'm a grapefruit. Nathan's laughing. Okay, why, why am I not a grapefruit? I'm a, I'm, let me convince you. I've got the texture and the color of a grapefruit. I have the rotund shape of a grapefruit. And if you puncture me, I'm juicy. <laughs> Liquids come forth. Therefore, I am a grapefruit. Okay, now we see that as, as silly. But isn't that the way we kind of live our Christian lives sometimes? You know, one of the... the 
greatest things that anybody has ever said to me is, I could tell you're a Christian. One of the most heartbreaking things anyone's ever said to me was, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. And this is after that we had known each other for a while. Okay? So, repentance from dead works is having your thoughts changed about the stuff you do so that it's no longer doing things contrary to what God would have. That, that measure of missing the mark is diminished. Okay? So, repentance from dead work summed up to have your thinking changed, which would then result in having your actions changed such that you would begin to do your work unto God instead of anything else. Number two, faith towards God. This comes from the Greek word pistis. It is conviction of anything. Belief. Okay? So, well, I've got a lot of beliefs. <clears throat> yes, you do. Yes, I do. But what is the, the last part of that phrase? Faith toward God. <clears throat> okay? Now, what's the, I love when Scripture gives me definitions so I don't have to go and trust Webster. Uh, I, I like Webster, but sometimes he just gets way out there on things. What's really interesting is if you go at, back to, say, even 60 years ago, and you read Webster's, the definitions that they have there are different than the definitions that we have here. Because Noah Webster was a believer. And as such, it tainted in a good way, let's say tinted, everything that he did in his dictionary. And so he was not ashamed to talk about God and his definitions of everything, every word. Well, over the course of the years, Noah's Webster's dictionary has become secularized. They, they've stripped out a lot of that stuff, okay? And as a result, we get words and definitions that don't really line up with what I'm reading in the Word, okay? Because our words aren't exactly the same thing as their words. Well, we always use the example of love. You know, as a, an English speaker, I love my dog, I love SpaghettiOs, I love my wife. And those three things are not loved equally. They're not loved the same, but we have a poor uh, single word to describe all of the different emotions that cover those things, okay? So, faith towards God is to have a conviction of God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says that faith, this is our definition, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. I love that phrase here because so often we talk about hope as something that we think might be. But that's not faith. Because faith is being certain that it is. We're, we're not people that are wishing for something to happen. Gosh, I really think this might. And it would be really cool if. Scripture says that we are assured that it will happen. The uh, assurance of things hoped for. <clears throat> The conviction of things unseen. Okay? I'm going to try and squish this pretty compactly. Jesus came back from the dead and He appeared to the disciples except Thomas wasn't there. And, and uh, Thomas comes in after Jesus had left and they told him the Master has risen and, and Thomas says, well, I won't believe unless I touch Him, unless I put my finger in his side. Now everybody gives Thomas a hard time. But none of them believe. Remember? Because Jesus sent the women to him. And they didn't believe. As a matter of fact, Peter and John, they had to go check it out for themselves. So they run down to the, to the tomb. And John, being the quicker of the two, gets there. But he doesn't go in. Peter gets there. He just goes right on in. And they don't understand what happened. They're, they're confused. What, what's going on here? Okay, I honestly believe that God blinded them for a time because Jesus told them what was coming. But God blinded them for a time so that when Jesus rose, their eyes were opened. 
Their, their eyes opened up to what God's plan was. Okay? So they come back and they're talking to the other disciples. They didn't believe. They didn't know what was going on. Now poor Thomas, he says what every one of them was thinking. And we call him Thomas the Doubter. I like Thomas. Because God did not condemn him for his uncertainty. As a matter of fact, when Jesus showed up, he wasn't pointing the finger at him. Oh, you monkey-headed moron. No, he said, hey, look, look. Touch and feel. But then he says something interesting that I think goes right along with this. He says, um, you believe because you have seen. But blessed are those who believe without seeing. That's us. Okay? The, the conviction of what we don't see. The assurance of what we hope for. Uh, going on, a little for, uh, couple verses down in Hebrews 11, uh, verse 6. Um, they also go on and says, um, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Not, not unlikely. Not, not uh, hmm, possibly. The word is emphatic. Without faith, you cannot please God. You can't do it. Okay? Why? Well, read the rest of the verse. For whoever would draw near to God must believe two things. One, that He exists. You have to believe that He exists. And two, that He rewards them who seek Him. Okay? That's, that's faith in a nutshell. You have a certainty, a certitude in your life that God exists and that His heart is to reward you. Okay? You have a certainty of the hope that we have. This is going to happen. I just don't know when. I, I, I really don't know when. You know, people get into arguments all the time about the rapture and, and the, the incoming and, and, and when it's going to happen and the order it's going to happen and who's going to be where. And, and I will tell you this, you're 50-50 because you're either right or you're wrong. That's your odds. You're either right or you're wrong. I have heard very very sharp and studied answers for each of these positions. Okay? My hope, what I believe, is that Christ is going to take His church out of the way before God's wrath comes. But I'll tell you what, it's going to get ugly. It's going to get ugly. Because the enemy wants to destroy the church of God. And as that time clock starts counting down, we're going to see an increase in the frequency and intensity of the labor pains. And while we are here, we are going to be subject to that, except that God keeps His hand on us. Honestly, I don't know how those people down in Las Vegas did it without God. I really don't. I, I really don't. So, faith. Scripture gives us the definition that we need in Hebrews chapter 1. Um, I'm going to... Let's go on to uh, instructions about washings. Some do other people have something different in your translation. What is the phrase there? What does it say? Uh, it's chapter six, verse two. Doctrine of baptism. Doctrine of baptism. Okay. Anybody have anything different? Instruction about cleansing rites. Okay. About okay. The, the Greek right here is didache <coughs> baptismos. Okay. Literally, it's, it's we, we would say teachings of baptism, but baptism is a transliterated word. word. We stole it from the Greek. Okay. And, and literally what he's saying is washings. Now, we talked in the, in the message about this, about how many times and, and under what circumstances uh, a good Jew would have to be washed. Um, just as, as a, a common person among the nation of Israel, you would have to be washed under a, a, a number of different circumstances. If you were actually of the Levites, there were more circumstances that were added to you. And if you were a priest, there were even more. 
The whole idea, the whole understanding about this frequency of washing, because Jesus said, okay, well, you know, it's not the outside of the cup that makes you unclean. It's the inside of the cup. But they're doing all of these symbolic washings. Why in the world? If it's not addressing the problem on the inside, why are they? Because God wants them to realize how unclean they are. Okay? It is a direct corollary from the outside, those things that contaminate, to the inside. And whereas we have the baptism, the washings, the ritual washings and, and the mikvahs, there is also the ritual washing of the inside through sacrifice. Okay? Now what's interesting is baptism is one of two ordinances that, that the Protestant church follows. Okay? Baptism being that identification with Christ. That we are His, and because we are His, we are like Him, that we have been crucified, buried, and then resurrected again. Okay? You are telling the world that I am one with Him. That's where my allegiance lay. Before my political party, before my country, before my family, before everything, I am His. That's how important baptism is today. Okay? Unfortunately, we, we've tended to uh, strip that a little bit of what God really intended that to be. Um, but of the two ordinances, we have baptism, which is, is a, a one and done thing, because once you've declared your allegiance, you, you don't need to declare your allegiance anymore. Now, that's not to say that you can't be baptized more than once. I've been baptized three times. The first time, I don't even remember. I, I, my grandmother was in the Lutheran church, and they did whatever. You know, I don't know if they blew on me or showered me or I don't know. But then uh, another time when I was young, because all of the other kids were getting baptized, and, and uh, I kind of understood a little bit about what was going on. It wasn't personal. Hey, man, it was my six and a half seconds in the limelight. Boop, boop, and off I went. All right? And then there was the last time when it was real to me. When this is when I decided, you know what? I need to publicly declare whose I am. Okay? So uh, if you've been baptized more than once, I'm not condemning you. But once you've done this with you, your full understanding and you've declared your allegiance, oh, I'm sorry, fourth time, because the last time I was baptized was in Israel uh, in the Jordan River. Christy and I got to be baptized together. Um, so I, just because you've had it more than once doesn't mean it's of no effect, but I honestly believe until you understanding what this represents and embracing all that it is, all you are is getting wet. Okay? It's just like communion. That's the other ordinance. Uh, in communion, we partake of the, the Last Supper, a, a kind of a modified version of the Seder, and we take and we eat of his body that is broken on our behalf, and we drink of his blood that was shed on our behalf. It was uh, the, the blood that sealed a new covenant, and, and a covenant that is better for us in every way. And, and that's something we need to stress. It's better for us, not necessarily better for God. Because God's perfect. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need anything to be better. Okay? So, um, baptism, communion. Uh, baptism is a, a, a one and done. Communion is a, an ongoing reminder. Okay? Of, of really why we got baptized. Because of what He paid for us. Mm -hmm. the, the redemption price. Okay? So, baptism. Teachings of washings. Uh, now, I'm going to summarize... These three subjects here, this is my statement. Uh, there are notes up here so you can come back and look at it. This is a little bit of a run-on sentence. I was allowing Paul to write through me. If any of you have ever read Paul's writings, you know he loved run-on sentences. So the doctrine of baptism is as follows. A person being convinced of their sinful nature and made aware of God's righteous requirements who then exhibits a saving faith that is unto a definitive action of repentance, who embraces the grace that God has offered by accepting the vicarious sacrifice of Jesus and confesses Jesus as Lord, believing Him raised from the dead, will demonstrate this marvelous transformation of death to His old self 
and rebirth into a new creation. Having been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, by publicly proclaiming his conversion, a deed that has already been accomplished by the grace of God through faith, for all to see by being baptized in water. You see how each of those things works together? That, that each one is dependent on the others and they're knit together to make a solid whole. Okay. Now, each of these doctrines is such. They are all going to be used to build on each other that we would have a sure and certain foundation. Okay, so moving forward, we're going to talk about the laying on of hands. <coughs> we looked through Scripture for examples of laying on of hands. My understanding is that the laying of hands always signals a separating out for something. Okay? We see that it is uh, separated out to bless. Uh, we see that when um, Abraham blessed, I'm sorry, not Abraham, Jacob blessed uh, Joseph's sons. He reached out his hand and he laid his hands and he actually crossed them, remember? And he gave the blessing of the older son to the younger son and the younger son to the older son. And, and, and he put his hand on them and he blessed them. Okay? Um, so we see that it is a separation out for blessing. We see that it is also a separating out to impart the miraculous. Um, one of the stories that I absolutely love, Matthew chapter 8, a, a leper comes to Jesus and asks to be healed. And, and I love this story because uh, throughout Scripture, even by the mandate of the law, lepers were pariahs. They, they did not get to exist within the society. They were cut out and separated out. Okay? And they actually had to announce as they came around people, they had to, to, to say that they were lepers so that people could shun them. Because, uh, uh, now keep in mind that when we say leprosy from the standing of Scripture, that was a number of, of skin diseases. Okay? It wasn't just leprosy itself. But most of them were extremely contagious. And so they had to be separate from people. So they lost not only that social connection with everybody that they knew and loved and loved them, but, but they also lost, lost that, that one thing that is so desperate for people is physical touch. Because people wouldn't be in the same room as them and, and people wouldn't touch them. And this, this leper comes to Jesus and he says, you know, if, if you will, I can be healed. Mm -hmm. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't just stand off at a distance like he did with the, the centurion servant. You know, he, he didn't go to the centurion's house. He, he just said it would happen and it happened. Okay? He reached out and he violated social taboo. And he touched him. He laid his hands on him to impart the miraculous. Did he have to do that? No, absolutely not. We, we've seen examples where Jesus healed without touching someone. I think that was the heart of God. <clears throat> represented by the Son of God touching a broken, a, a corrupt humanity and, and was restoring hope and life and love. Okay, so this, this man, definitely, he, his life was changed because he was healed, but the Son of God touched him, laid his hand on him. Okay, so laying on of hands to impart the miraculous. Um, number three, to make holy for a purpose. We see this in the Old Testament when the priests were called. There was a laying on of hands. We see when the sacrifices were brought for sin, the, the person bringing the sacrifice would lay the hands on the animal. We see this in the New Testament when they were organizing the church and, and the elders were being kind of put on, oh, the, we're not getting our food, the Jews are getting it, the Greeks are not. And they said, you know, this, this is not something that... We should be bogged down with. So choose for yourself seven righteous men. Now what's interesting about this is the seven men that they chose were in every way as qualified as the elders. But their call was different. Okay? If you ever have the opportunity, look in Timothy and Titus for the uh, description of what it is required for an elder and a deacon. There is one difference, and I'll let you guys look it up and see if you can tell me what that one difference is. Okay, but um, 
Paul and Barnabas, when they were going to be sent out into uh, Asia Minor, they laid hands on them to send them out. Okay? Uh, next, with, next one, for the baptism of the Spirit. Um, we see in Acts that oftentimes when they came into a fellowship, there were believers there, but they were believers because of the testimony and witness of John the Baptist. They had received John's baptism, but they didn't really understand that there was a greater baptism, and that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, John says, I baptize you with water, but, but he will baptize you with fire. And we see that the, the Holy Spirit came on all of those in the upper room. What, was the, what did they see? It was a, as if a, a flame was on them. Okay, And so the laying on of hands was often used, not always, but often used with the, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> so, laying on of hands, why do we not have a doctrine for that when Scripture says it's a doctrine? I don't know. I really don't. I think uh, an unspoken we do because there are times when people are sick and we bring them up to the front. What do we do? We, we lay hands on them. Um, when, when people were going out from our fellowship um, to, to minister elsewhere, what did we do? We laid hands on them. Okay? So I think maybe what we just need to do is put it in writing. Okay? So the next one, we're moving on. Laying on of hands. Um, resurrection of the dead. First thing you need to understand about this is that this is a literal and physical resurrection. Okay? It is both literal and physical. One of the things that has kind of grown into the Western church, and, and it started very early on in the foundation of the church, uh, is this idea um, that the body and anything to the body, do with the body is corrupt and sinful, and only the soul and the spirit are redeemed. The body is not. If that were the case, Paul wouldn't have written what he wrote, and Jesus would not have been resurrected physically. He would have been resurrected spiritually or with his soul or whatever. We know that is not the case because people saw him, talk to him, and touched him. Right? So literally, he was raised from the dead. When they went to go find his body, guess what? It wasn't there because he was still in it. Now, it was transformed. It was not the same body that we have. As a matter of fact, a lot of them didn't even recognize him until he spoke. Okay? Uh, remember the two on the road to Emmaus. The men, they're, they're having lengthy conversation with this guy. And they didn't understand until the last minute when he revealed it to them and their eyes were opened. Okay? Um, when the women first saw him, they, they thought he was the gardener. Okay? Then he spoke and their eyes were opened. Okay? So, um, first thing to understand is it's literal and physical. When God created man, He created him body, soul, and spirit. And He said, this is very good. Body, soul, and spirit. Now somewhere along the way, we got this twisted thinking in our minds that, you know, the body is... Well, you know what? Our soul and our spirit were an offense before God, much more so than our bodies were. Okay? And when God sent Jesus to redeem us, he redeemed body, soul, and spirit. That's why we believe that the resurrection will be literal and physical. It will be a changed body. I can't wait because all of us diabetics are going to get together and we're going to party. <laughs> I'm going to be like, cake, cake, Shelly, cake! Okay? It's going to be a body that is, is, is permanently better than what we have. All right, so um, there will be two types of resurrection. Okay, I believe that, that the first type will be done in, in a series of events. I believe the first part, this is the, the resurrection of the believers. This is unto eternal life and, and rewards. I believe the first resurrection already happened because when Jesus died, it says that the tombs of all the righteous people were opened and they came out. And then when Jesus ascended, we find out, uh, uh, quoting a psalm, that he led a great train, a, a host 
Okay? And Paul reiterates this. He says the same thing, that, that Jesus led a great train when he ascended. I believe that was the first resurrection of the righteous. I believe there will be a, a second. There will possibly be several resurrections of the righteous. Okay? This is a, a thing where our bodies will be... Now, back up a step. Those that were resurrected when Jesus died, I believe their physical bodies were resurrected in that moment. And I believe boop, they, they went. Everyone that has died from that point to this, as soon as their soul, their spirit departed their body, they were immediately in the presence of God. But their body stayed here. Okay? And there is coming a time when Jesus appears in the cloud and with a loud shout, those bodies will be raised up they will be reunited, transformed in an instant from mortal to immortal, from perishable to imperishable, and they will be with Christ. And immediately after, I don't know how close, but immediately after, those who are here, those who are left that are alive, up we go. Okay? And, and the same process will happen with us. The, the mortal will put on the immortal and the perishable will put on the imperishable. Our, our bodies will be redeemed at last. Okay? But the second type of resurrection is the resurrection of those who do not believe. And these will be resurrected and, and um, they will stand before God. And, and our last one, I'm going to kind of blend the two of these together because they're so dependent on one another. Okay? When the righteous are resurrected, they're resurrected and they face a judgment. Okay? But it's not a judgment to determine your eternity. That was already determined when you were sealed with the Spirit. All right, so it's not a judgment as to heaven or hell. It is a judgment unto rewards. All right? When, when you come before God, whether it be as a soul and a spirit because you died here on earth, or whether it be because He came back and you stood before Him, He is going to judge you based on what you did right, that He can reward you, and then these rewards we want to offer back to Him. Okay, so that's the first resurrection, and that's also the, the first judgment. Okay, it's not a judgment as to whether you're in or whether you're out. All right, then the second resurrection, uh, we see this in Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne. It says that uh, the, the death, hell, the grave, they gave up their dead. They came and they stood before the great white throne. Books were opened. And their deeds were judged, every one. Okay? Now, if we stop right there, that could be us. Because our deeds are going to be judged. And, and Scripture actually says in Corinthians that, that uh, it, it's as though we are, all of our work will be put through a fire. And only what survives is what, what goes on. Okay? So all that is, is unworthy. All that is unredeemed, unredeemable, all of that is burned up. But we come out the other side and unto rewards. All right? Um, so some of us will get there and, and there will be a tremendous amount of rewards waiting for us. Some of us are just going to be glad to get there. All right? So, but the great white throne, they look at all their works and, and that the works are judged. But then the, the key ingredient here is they check the master book, the master list the book of the Lamb, the book of life. And if their names are not in there, then their judgment, you know, I wouldn't surprise me at all if they received rewards in some kind because of the good that they did, but those, those are not going to be of any value because they are going to be cast into the lake of fire, which is also described as the outer darkness, okay, where they will, with full understanding, be completely separated from God. Okay, now, there's a lot of people walking around in the world today that we go, oh, well, they just don't know God. There's a separation there. But the Spirit of God is here in the world. Mm -hmm. God's hand is still at work mm -hmm. in the world. So in some measure, where uh, in an unconscious level, we don't understand the Spirit of God is still working and, and our souls are cognizant of this. <clears throat> All right? They will see, they will bow, they will acknowledge, and they will be cast aside. Now, keep in mind, Scripture says where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I grew up with the understanding that the, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth was, oh, woe is me, I can't believe I screwed up, oh, no. But when I, I started looking at this, um, if you read gnashing of teeth in Scripture, it's never unto sorrow. It's never as a result of sorrow. 
It's always as a result of anger. I believe that they will be in hell and they will be raising their fists to God for eternity, speaking vile, vitriolic hatred toward their creator. They will be gnashing their teeth at him in hatred and anger. Okay? So that's, that's the second resurrection and the second judgment. Okay? Um, the first resurrection, the first judgment type, is unto the believers who will be judged according to their works to what survived the fire, unto rewards. Their eternity is not in doubt. Their name's in the book. It's done. The second is the resurrection of the dead unto judgment. Their names are not in the Lamb's book of life. They are cast aside forever. Okay? So, let's wrap this up. <clears throat> Repentance from dead work. Being convinced in your mind that what God says is true that leads to not just a change in thinking but a change in action. Dead works are anything that are not done unto God. In Colossians it says, whatever you do in word or in or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. Okay, that, That's what I think he's trying to get at here. All right, um, faith towards God, justice, a belief, the assurance of things hoped for, the certainty of things unseen, without which you cannot please God. Instructions about washings, that identification with the suffering, death, resurrection, and lordship of Jesus Christ. We are identifying ourselves as His. Yeah, I, I, I'm a Christian. That, that's something we should take pride in. You know, it was originally given to the church as an insult. You know, oh, look at all those guys. They're just like little Christs walking around. Ha, ah, look at them. And, and the church looked at that and they, they embraced it. They said, yeah, the perfect. That describes me perfectly. I want to be just like him. Okay? So instructions about washings. Uh, the laying on of hands. Uh, we still do this in the church today. We do it to bless. We do it to, to separate out. Um, we do it for, for praying for the impartation of the miraculous. All right? Um, resurrection of the dead. Two different types. And eternal judgment that fall under those two types of resurrection. Okay? Those that are resurrected um, to be given uh, the, the, the white robes. And, and having been put through the fire, they take their rewards and they, they present them to Christ. And those who didn't go through the fire, they spend eternity in the fire because they have refused and rejected Jesus Christ. Hebrews says that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. All right, and, and I think if we really understood, I, I really wish that, that we could all have a, a, a vision of the holiness and might the awe-inspiring, gut-wrenching presence of the Almighty God. Because every time that happened in Scripture, it was significant. And, and those men's lives were changed. Okay? I, I think we don't appreciate just how vastly different God is from us. Okay? Okay, so, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So now you've got the groundwork. Okay? You've got the foundation. Now we've got to start pressing in to the deeper things of God, the weightier things of God. It's time to grow up. Time to put the binky aside. Time to get out of the training pants. Get on our knees. It's time to be mature. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank You. Father, that You are so loving to us that You give us Your Word that you teach us, that you instruct us, that your Holy Spirit is there to bring insight, wisdom to the knowledge that is contained in your word. I ask God that you would make us a people that are hungry for your word, with hearts of fire to press in after you, that we would not be content with where we are in our relationship with you, but that we would always 
press in harder. That we would hunger and thirst for you. I ask God that you would give us minds that would understand, that would retain your word, that, Father, it would be knitted deep in our hearts in the good soil, that it would grow and bear much fruit. And I ask, Lord God, that your hand of, of mercy and grace would be so evident in our lives that other people would ask us, what is it? What is it? And that, Father, we would be prepared to give them an answer. We thank you for all of these things, Father, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.